Okay, I think we're live. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Today we're beginning a new topic, and I, I think the title will be uh, The Eternality of Jesus. Uh, and this, this topic was um, inspired by me because of uh, Brother uh, Joseph, uh, uh, known on YouTube as uh, Sebastian Dresden. Uh, he made a video, and it uh, got me thinking. And I, I started investigating this further. I thought this is uh, an important subject to, to look into. It's, it's probably going to be broader than, than he originally imagined, but I still think it's important and uh, very interesting. I want to say first that uh, some of the things we're going to be discussing today, uh, even at this present moment, I still have not come to any really uh, uh, strong convictions and conclusions uh, on some of this. I'm hoping that as we discuss this today, maybe with everybody else's help, that uh, maybe I will be able to actually be more confident in my conclusions. But bef before we get started in the topic, uh, I'd like for uh, the panelists to just say hi and introduce themselves. Uh, go ahead, Brother Bill. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Hello, my name is Bill, and, and my channel is The Panda Man Evangelist. And by its title, you can tell that. that I like to evangelize, and also obviously like to, to, to join these hangouts and have good fellowship with, with good brothers and sisters, but that, that is my, my key aim on, on YouTube is to evangelize the, the glorious gospel of Christ. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Brother Bill, and uh, uh, I know many of you probably already know Brother Bill, and uh, if you don't know him, please, I, I hope you go look at his channel, The Panda Man Evangelist and to subscribe to his channel. I'm sure you'll be blessed and learn a lot. And uh, next we have Brother Joseph. He's Sebastian Dresden. Uh, you want to say hi and tell everybody about what your ministry is? Well, uh, I, my name is Joe. I go by Sebastian uh, Dresden here on YouTube lately. And uh, my channel is just about fellowship, not really teaching or anything. Uh, but every now and then I, I think of something that I haven't heard before and I like to put it out there and uh, this is one of those times so I'm grateful uh, to you uh, brother Luke for uh, passing this along okay all right thank you brother Joseph uh, you uh, you know I hope you're able to uh, participate uh, during the entire discussion but I understand you may have to leave early if, if that turns out to be the case then that'll be fine but um, I'm going to ask you first to um, kind of summarize uh, the initial video that you put up that caused me to start thinking about all this. If you could, you think you can do that in a couple of minutes and then, and then we'll take it from there. Okay, Luke. Uh, this is, you know, I, I had this uh, thought actually quite a while ago and, and nobody seemed to be interested, but I, you know, I, I think it's hugely important. There, there's a big, anything that divides the body is important to me. And, and this is one of those things, uh, the Trinity. Now, I've gone out on YouTube, and I've done a little uh, investigating into videos regarding the Trinity. And <clears throat> we have modalists, people who think Christ, uh, it, it's a Jesus-only thing, where he reveals himself as the Father, as the Son, and as the Holy Spirit. There's the, uh, that's the Jesus-only people. And then there's other types of modalists who believe similar things, but the Father is the main entity. There's uh, the Jewish believers who believe in the one God, but they don't see the three persons. There's, of course, the Trinity, uh, Trinitarians, uh, that most of us find ourselves in that camp. And we believe in the three persons and the one God, in one essence. But when it comes to uh, grasping it or explaining it, we, we often hear the, the water, ice, gas thing or... Uh, basically, when you listen to any of the Trinitarian explanations of the Trinity, it ends up like this. Trust not in your own understanding. Lean on, you know, what you can't understand. It's beyond us. And that's the, the final word. I mean, they give all kinds of illustrations, but they always end the same way. We can't get it, so let's not try. Uh, best leave things we can't understand to God. And, and, and that's fine. I, I grasp that with many issues. Uh, but... In this particular issue, I think uh, I stumbled on something that, you know, to me makes sense. 
and it's not from my own imaginations, it's from scripture. And uh, so I'll give you a quick summary of, of what I think. <clears throat> I was doing a study in Revelations, and it was in regards to a show you were doing a while back, uh, Luke, and just preparing to listen to your show like I often do. And and uh, I went back to Genesis to check on something in Revelations. The two books kind of are nice bookends. And and I saw something. It, it was talking about how Christ or how uh, uh, God created man. He created man out of dust. He breathed life into man. And then he created the, the creatures and, and, and other parts of creation. And then after everything was created, he said, wait a minute, it's not good that a man should be alone. And he said, you know, let's, let's uh, make him a helpmate. And, and, and so what happened is, is Eve was created, but she, Eve wasn't really created. And this is the thing. He didn't breathe life into Eve. He didn't take the dust of the ground to create Eve. He took Eve from Adam. And if you look in the original Greek, it's not really his rib that he took, but rather from, it's talking about a, a box. It's almost like uh, the like Adam had a both female and male uh, anatomies, like hermaphrodite almost. And he took that part from Adam to create Eve. And he didn't have to breathe life into Eve. She was already alive, pre-existent within Adam. Now, when he created Eve, when he took Eve from Adam, also out of Adam came certain attributes. Uh, his feminine part, if you will. Adam was both male and female, and I believe that was not just physical, but I believe it was uh, both uh, emotional and certain uh, attributes that were taken out of Adam along with the physicality that, that he that he made Eve from and I kept going back <clears throat> to let us make man in our image and then I started thinking you know God is kind of a, a tricky uh, situation here with the Trinity the three persons of the Godhead one essence and then I started thinking well Eve was one essence, the same substance of Adam. And Eve was separated from Adam for what reason? As company, as, as a helpmate, as a companion, as a co-creator. In other words, everything that was created, as far as the earthly line goes, had to be created after Eve was taken apart from Adam. They were still one. God said, let them be one. Let you be one. He wasn't talking about intercourse. I mean, that was part of it. He was more talking about spirit, spiritually, physically. They were one essence. She was, Eve, Eve existed as long as Adam did. Eve was equal to Adam. It wasn't like now they're 50-50. It's they were 100-100. They were the same essence. And then I kept going back, let us make man in our image. He didn't do this with any other creatures. He didn't take a cow and say, let's make take a female out of the cow and, and you know, one cow make one male, one female. No, no, he created the male and female with humans, with Adam. That didn't happen. He took Eve from Adam. Now, that's we're a unique creature. All other creatures were created male and female not humans. But because he kept saying, let us make man in our image, I think it was the plan from the beginning. What happened, I believe, in the beginning was there was God. A one God in essence and substance. And I believe at the very beginning, before anything else was created, that the Father said, I want to have part of myself for companionship, for creation, for making myself whole by having fellowship. And I believe that the Son, the only begotten Son, the Word of God, was not created as the modalist will say, well, it has to be one God. I believe just like he took Eve from Adam, Eve was always pre-existent, always part of Adam, 
the Son, Jesus Christ, the, the, the Word, was taken from the Father, one essence, one substance, 100%, 100%, not 50-50, and create, not created, but begotten. And that's what the, the, the Bible says, that Christ is his only begotten, not created, not born, not birth, but begotten. I believe that the Son is part of the Father in essence, substance, and and uh, every other way, just like Adam and Eve. And then at the point he that Christ became a separate person, like Eve became a separate person with Adam, while they were still one, Christ the Father, Christ the, or the Father and the Son are one. Now, when this happened, I believe it's my what came to my mind was that there was actually a personification of the spirit of love that united the Father and Son. I believe that to be the third person of the Trinity. I believe what unites the Father and the Son in essence and in being is the spirit that came from the, the, the not the separation, but the, the division and that's what keeps those two unified. I believe when you blaspheme the Holy Spirit, you're blaspheming the very love, the very thing that unites the Father and Son. Furthermore, I believe that before the fall, Adam and Eve actually had a human spirit, but a spirit of love that connected them more than physicality, but is an actual spiritual connection that united Adam and Eve in, as one in love. And I believe it was an actual personification of spirit of love that was between those two, just as there is between the Father and the Son. Now, if you go to Revelations, and this is where all this started, when the eternal city comes down on the new earth and, and God steps into time for eternity and becomes at one with his new creation, you'll find there are two thrones in the holy city. Now, the modalist and, and uh, the Jewish people, and they can't get around this. It, there's two thrones, one for the Father, one for the Son. Two thrones, two people, two persons, two personalities, yet one in essence, like Adam and Eve, would have been had it not been for the fall. And I believe the Spirit is the very personification of love that, that unites these two persons. And, and, uh, and when the fall happened, I believe that spirit was killed, died between them. And that's where marriage comes in and legal contracts and don't stray and all these things. Because that personification or that spiritual love between them was, was killed with the, with the fall of man. And so that's why we may not be able to see the Trinity as, as I believe God has showed me in the Scripture. I'm not making this up. It's just what I think I've seen by reading the Scripture. And I, what was the Scripture I sent in Romans? Uh, there's a part, oh, it's escaping me, but there's a verse that actually references what I'm saying, and I, I hope Brother Luke will have it. I, I, let me see if I can, oh, I don't know what I did with it. But it, it, there's one Scripture that talks about, you know, the 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 son being a part of the father. I uh, believe Romans 17 or something. But I, I can't remember. But anyway, that's basically the uh, doctrine that came to me, and and that, that's as nutshell as I can put it. And I'm probably leaving that stuff out, but there you go. I did it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, first first I'd like to compliment you on your explanation. Uh, uh, you know, I I watched your video when it initially came out, and then I watched it again more recently. Uh, but I think your explanation there was even better, uh, maybe because you've had a lot more time to think and study and maybe practice. The more we, I found out from my experience that the more I talk about things, the better I get at explaining them. So you did an excellent job explaining all of that, and the uh, pretty much everything you said I think are in my notes to be discussed. I'm not going to try to answer it now because it may take us two hours or maybe next Sunday or four hours. I don't know how long it's going to take to get through it all but uh, I, I think in my notes we're going to discuss a lot of the terminology and the ideas that you put forth there and uh, I, I do think, still think it's uh, 
hearing it again, I think it's fascinating. It's well thought out, very controversial, I would suspect. I suspect some people are uh, probably hate you right now for even saying such things. <laughs> because because uh, Christendom suffers from dogmatism to uh, like a fatal fatal uh, dogmatism. I had some lady attack me over and over and over again last night. I just, uh, huh. Yeah. Well, um, as you know, um, uh, I, I, my opinion, and I, I know Bill agrees with me, that uh, if we agree on these core doctrines of Christianity, then many other things, um, uh, all kinds of other theological subjects and theories, we should be able to discuss them and not, uh, not re not get angry with each other, even if someone brings forth an idea that is new or different, or even some people might say, well, that's not very bizarre or something. Uh, I like those, uh, all these different ideas, because I think the more we discuss them, we all learn together. But uh, I'm not sure how much, how much Brother Bill has been familiar with the initial video, and I'd like to get his reaction before we go further to uh, your opening statement there. Brother Bill? Yeah, I'm still, that, that was actually very deep, and I'm still trying to digest that. Now, the, the way obviously I see it, I, I think that, 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 that Brother Sebastian has made some good valid points, and I agree with just about everything you said. The only, the only thing I would distinguish is that, that, that the Holy Spirit, although he mentioned did bring unity within within the Godhead and and obviously with the, the man and the woman you know I, I'm of the belief that the Holy Spirit is a person as well i.e. a he so that, that's obviously because I, I am Trinitarian so the Father, Son, the Holy Ghost they're all he's and they're, and they're persons and I, just, I suppose I want to ask Sebastian if he agreed with what I just said then or is, does he think that, that, that the Holy Ghost is, is a completely entirely different entity from the Godhead or a part of the Godhead but not a person? I weren't quite sure about that. A lot to digest. Yeah, yeah Bill. Uh, I, yeah, I, I get that. No, I absolutely believe the third person of the Trinity is an individual personification of God. Uh, I Just as the Son came from the Father. I believe the Spirit also came from the unit, union of the Father and the Son. In other words, I believe he is a, a distinct individual uh, person of the Trinity that, now this is conjecture, unlike the Father and the Son, I believe it was an Adam and Eve situation. I think he made man in his image based on that. All creation happened after the Son was begotten whatever that means, and I think this is what that means, because with Adam and Eve, all creation, as far as mankind was concerned, started after the creation of Eve. So when he said, like, let us make man in our image, Christ came out of him, all creation began. I believe that upon that separation, but they, they were still one in essence, 100%, 100%, I believe that the third person of the Trinity was naturally... Uh, released, maybe that's the word, released uh, with, with that separation or that personification of two persons. I believe the third person was then released. The, the Spirit is called the love of God, the Spirit of God, the thing that unites God. He brings all attention to the Father and to the Son, not himself. I believe that, I believe he is a personification that was released upon that begotten nature of Christ which in essence was the father, you know, uh, the same way Eve was within Adam. I, and I, and it's total conjecture that there was a spiritual unification between the man and the woman before the fall. I'm basing that simply on how I see the personification of the Holy Spirit as begotten at the same time the Son was begotten. I believe that's what unifies the father and the Son, that person. Mm. Right, yeah, 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 very deep again, yeah, it is, it is very, very deep. I'm glad, obviously, that you you agree that, obviously, they are they are three persons. Uh, but you're, you're, yeah, you're really, you're broad, you're really stretching my mind on me, so I'm going to 
I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna think for a minute because I had I, as you were speaking, I, I did have a verse come to mind. But you are you you you, you spoke <coughs> a lot of things and there's a lot of different angles and 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 things to ponder on just within that very short sentence. So I shall be back shortly, and when I suddenly remember that verse, I, I shall bring it up. Yeah, I, I would I would add also that the, that scripture is plain that at the time of the fall, that at it says you will surely die. I believe they spiritually died on the spot. Now the physical death, of course, came eventually, but I believe there was a spiritual death, and that was the spirit of love that was between them that communed with God. Now God could still communicate with them, obviously, because He came and covered them with with uh, clothes, but. Uh, I believe there was a communion between the two, a, a spirit between the man and the woman that naturally flowed with the person of the Holy Spirit in communion with God. And I believe that died instantly upon sin entering into their lives. Okay, well, uh, Brother Bill is letting all that soak in. Uh, and, you know, I, I've heard that before, so I've had more time to consider this already. Uh, and uh, if you're hearing this for the first time, you, be, you may be like Brother Bill and say, whoa, this is amazing what you're saying. Well, I, I need to think about this and sort it out. <laughs> Brother Bill has a series of videos called Sorted, too, where he sorts things out. So maybe he's doing that in his own mind right now. Uh, but while he's doing that, I want to kind of lay the groundwork for the rest of the study now. And um, so first I want to do, um, if you're familiar with my channel, you know that um, on every video, I have almost 400 videos up on every one of my videos in my description section, I post my statement of faith uh, because I want people to know my core beliefs. and. Uh, uh, I think at this point, now I want to read the core beliefs and you just take a few seconds. There's only about six or eight things I'm going to say, but uh, there's um, the reason I want to do this is because uh, there are certain core beliefs here that apply to this whole subject here. So uh, I am a Christian, one who relies entirely on Jesus Christ for salvation and eternal life. Jesus Christ is the eternal God, the only Savior, and the sole source of eternal life. Now, I've underlined here, in this case, Jesus Christ is the eternal God. And I go on, Jesus is the object of my faith. Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. And I've underlined that. Because these two statements are relevant to what we're discussing today. Jesus is the eternal God manifest in the flesh as the Son of God. Then I go on to say, when Jesus died on the cross, he paid for the sins of the whole world. When Jesus rose from the dead, he proved he has power over life and death. Jesus offers salvation and eternal life as a free gift to everyone. We receive the gift of eternal life through faith alone in Christ alone. Our salvation is eternally secure. We cannot lose it for any reason. Now that's my statement of faith, and uh, those are the core doctrines that I, I hold to, and, and there's a there's a hundred other theological questions that are fascinating, and some of them are really very important. They all range in degrees of importance, I think, uh, uh, but the other doctrines I pretty much say uh, we don't necessarily have to agree on all these other theological questions. Uh, let's have a lot of fun learning from each other as we discuss them. Uh, and so now here we are here, and this question has applications to my one of my core doctrines, and that is Jesus Christ is the eternal God. So my first question I'd like to ask both of you and everybody watching uh, and is, is the eternality of Jesus as an essential? Uh, in other words, is um, I believe that if someone uh, thinks that Jesus is not eternal, he has not existed he, uh, eternally. Now, how he existed 
we're going to, that's part of what we're going to be exploring. How did he exist eternally? Before the incarnation, before the virgin birth, how did he exist? How do you describe it? There's a lot of attempts to describe that. But the question is, not right now, how he existed, but did he exist eternally? And uh, uh, so let me get back to the, um, the panelists here for a second here and ask each of you to say, to, well, tell me, do you believe Jesus did exist eternally, eternally, and do you think that this is uh, uh, that an important of a uh, uh, doctrine that uh, it, for me, I say, if someone says Jesus is not eternal, that he is uh, created, he came into existence at some point in time, then that is worth dividing over. That is something that is uh, one of the most important essentials of Christianity. I'll start with Brother Bill. Yeah, yeah, well, my, my perspective is that, that Jesus Christ was eternal. You know, he wasn't created. He always was and will be the Alpha and Omega. And my, one of my favorite verses is, is in, in John, you know, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. So we know that this Jesus Christ, who we know is the Word, was co-creator of all that there is. And and we also know that, that, that only God, you know, eternally existent God, has the power to forgive sins. And we know that Christ forgives sins. So if Jesus, you know, it really does, it's so vital to the point that if Jesus was not God manifest in the flesh, then every single creature is destined for an eternity without God. Because Jesus claimed that he forgave sins. Jesus died on the cross to forgive sins. So he has to be eternally God and it manifests in the flesh. So yeah, he was co-creator and God manifests in the flesh. It's Bible. It's Bible. Okay, uh, I'll ask Joe next, but first let me say something about what Brother Bill just said. Is uh, The purpose of this study today is not so much to prove the eternality of Jesus. Uh, I, I've done that over the years now. I, I have one playlist called uh, um, The Deity of Christ, and, it, and it's dedicated to uh, proving that Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, I've got another playlist called uh, The Identity of Jesus, and that's a very, very thorough, exhaustive study proving the same thing, uh, identifying who he is. And, and, but uh, so in, today, uh, in this study, it's not so much a question of trying to prove that he's eternal, um, but uh, to ask the question, if someone doesn't believe that he is eternal, that he did not have a beginning, uh, is, is this something that you think, as I do, that is a dividing point? That it, it is so essential and so, as uh, Bill, I think, said vital, because without it, everything else falls apart in Christianity. Uh, first, okay, go ahead, Brother Joseph. Well, of course, it, it's it's a core uh, it's a core piece of knowledge that we must accept. Uh, it says that uh, the Father and I are Christ said the Father and I are one. The scripture in the Old Testament uh, points out that they are one. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit have, have been shown to be one, not only in nature but in essence. And uh, I and you know the angels and Lucifer became very jealous. I believe, especially Lucifer, of the creation of man. We were the only beings created in God's own image. And what happened? He created man. He in took. Eve, the very substance and essence and nature of Adam, and separated her into a separate person while she was still one in nature and essence and everything else, just as God. And then all creation happened after that, with as far as mankind goes. We were created in God's image. And so, yes, I absolutely believe it's a core doctrine that we must know that Christ is one, if God eternal one in nature, one in essence. I believe very much like Adam and Eve. All right, so what we're trying to do today is, is not 
proving that Jesus is eternal. This is something that we all declare, and I imagine that, that most of the people watching this, if, if you are um, you know, um, subscribers of ours, you know what we believe, and if you're in agreement with us, then this is not new to you. You know that we agree, all agree, and that hopefully you agree, that Jesus is eternal. He was not a creature. Uh, and so the point is now that we the, really the remainder of the study is going to be examined. Okay, if he's eternal, how exactly did he exist? And 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 it, before this virgin birth and this uh, God was manifest in the flesh, the Word became flesh and lived among us. These statements tell us that okay, he came into the world, and Jesus said the reason he came into the world was to give his life as a ransom for for us. So at some point. He came into the world, became a man so he could die for our sins, and he was raised from the dead, showing us he has victory, and he can give us eternal life. But how did he exist? How can we describe his existence prior to the incarnation? And so that's what we're going to be uh, looking at, and I might even say struggling with, because uh, as I look further into this, uh, I've been surprised at some of the things I've come up with that are a little bit uh, uh, were new to me. Uh, and as I said, I, I don't necessarily have any real strong conclusions on some of these questions yet. And as I listen to Brother Joseph explain it again now for the, the third time uh, I've heard this, uh, that uh, it's even more interesting to me as I hear it again and again. Uh, so uh, I'd like first, um, Brother Bill, if you could uh, give your explanation of the Trinity. Because the three of us are, are all in agreement that the the triunity of the Godhead uh, is is what we believe in. These three persons. We we are careful not to say separate persons because then people could say we're polytheists believing in three separate gods, but three distinct persons, distinct in that that, that, that uh, they have their own personage. Uh, and yet, we still believe in one God. We're not polytheists, as, as a Muslim would accuse us of. Uh, so, as, as Brother Joseph said earlier, people say, well, I believe in the Trinity, but then they, they struggle at explaining it. And they say, well, it's just a mystery. Even in, in some of the creeds, the Christian creeds, it calls this Trinity a mystery. And we, we just need to accept it as a mystery. And there's a lot of attempts at how to explain it. And I have my own idea of the best way to think of it, uh, but I, I'd like you to take a, a stab at it, Brother Bill. Uh, you, are, as a Trinitarian, uh, how is, how would you explain to the viewers the Trinity? Well, uh, only that there is a triunity that, that 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 God is. If you imagine God as the title, and the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Are, are the persons within that title, you know? So it, it, it's not, as you say, it's not, you know, polytheism. It's not, it's not different gods. You know, th th this is one god head. You know, in, in three equal persons. You know, all, all divine. You know, all one yet all individual. So in that sense, it is a mystery for for the human brain to fathom. You know, three people being one. So in, 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 the, in the, you know, in the human sense, it is a mystery. But in the godly sense, and the spiritual sense, and obviously the biblical sense, it's not so much of a mystery because the, the Bible declares it throughout. And to be honest, I've got to be honest. The best, one of the best explanations that, to help, you know, us mere mortals understand, you know, the Trinity, was done by our sister from Australia, with the example with the egg. It was absolutely fantastic, you know, where, where you had the you had the yolk, you had the white, and the shell. You know, that they are all one egg. You know, in, in essence, yet they are three individual, yet united portions of that one egg. And I think, you know, I would suggest that that you know, if, if maybe even we put a link to Sister Joanne's video on this video to to go and watch that, because to be honest, that is that is the best and most simplest way I've ever seen 
he had the Trinity explained in human terms. Okay, thank you, Brother Bill. Um, I, w I can give uh, Brother Joseph a chance to explain this, but I, I have a suspicion that he could just reference back to his opening statement. I, I, if I'm correct, this is your way of describing this relationship, this uh, triunity, this trinity, and uh, is there anything else you want to add to that? Well, just real quickly, I will point out very importantly that uh, number one, the Father uh, and the l l number one in the eternal city, there are two thrones. You don't put an egg on two thrones. I believe that there are two separate entities, persons within one essence. I believe they all came out of the Father God, the Holy Spirit and the Son. The Son is embodied. There can't get away from the fact. This is a fact, scripturally. Two thrones in the Holy City. And I believe the Spirit is what unites them. I believe in mankind, the, the, the man, Adam, was the head. But all creation came through Eve, the first created. It says Jesus was the first of all creation, yet he was not created. Eve was in mankind, was subordinate, but yet equal to Adam. I think that uh, let's not forget the two thrones that exist in the holy city. And I'll just leave it at that. Okay, uh, I'll t you know, I have explained this numerous times in the past, but my best attempt and making someone understand this triunity that we have one God, three persons, and yet it still remains one God. Here's my attempt. Uh, Brother Joseph referenced the st original statement in the scriptures in Genesis where we see these words, quote, let us make man in our image, unquote. Now a polytheist, like a Mormon, they use that verse and say, see, there's a plethora of gods. There's actually, Mormons say there's billions of gods, more gods than we can even number. Gods over all these own, uh, other worlds and universes. Um, but um, I'm not a Mormon, and I'm not a polytheist. Uh, uh, so some people would, would think that, well, let us make man in our image. They think that maybe God's having a conversation with angels or something, but that doesn't make sense either. Uh, I, I believe that when we understand that we are made in God's image and we are made as a triune creature, uh, you look at me right now and you see, well, that's Brother Luke. I can, I recognize him. And, but actually what you're seeing is the body of Brother Luke. You can't see my mind, but I have a mind. <laughs> Some people don't think I have a mind, but I have a mind. That's my consciousness, and what I would reference as the soul. The soul is your consciousness, your mind, your emotions, all those things will make up your, your, your soul. So you see my body, you know I have a soul, and my spirit is the third part of Brother Luke. And the spirit, when I was born into this world, my spirit was dead because I was born with a spiritually dead. My spirit had been, is not connected to the Holy Spirit. Uh, that's, we, we are all born into the world that way because of the fall of man. And um, when Adam and Eve fell, uh, they died that day spiritually. They died physically 800, 900 years later. And, uh, but when we're born into the world, we're born with a spiritually dead. And when we get born again, by putting our faith in Jesus, our spirit is brought to life and our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit. So we're regenerated spiritually. So we have here a picture of the Trinity. We have Brother Luke, you can see. You can see Brother Luke inside my mind here. You can't see it, but it's there. It's, it's part of who I am. And then you have my spirit and God's spirit united. And yet there's one Luke. Um, I don't think it's a perfect an analysis necessarily, uh, but it's better than any of the other that I've heard. I do also like Joanne's use of the egg, and we'll post that so you can consider that too. Uh, there is one that's commonly used that Joe cited, but it doesn't really 
really uh, support Trinitarianism, it supports modalism. And the idea of water, vapor, and ice, you have H2O. And H2O can exist as a gas, a vapor. It can exist as a, a water, a liquid. It can exist as a, a solid ice. Uh, it's still the same thing, it just changes forms. And that's what modalism is. They believe that uh, Jesus is God, or as Brother Joseph said, some think the Father is God. And, but there's one God, and, and this God simply operates in different modes. Sometimes he changes to vapor, sometimes he changes to ice. Uh, you know, actually, they would say that the, the Father sometimes operates as the Son, sometimes operates as the Holy Spirit or the Jesus only people, they say Jesus sometimes operates as the Father, sometimes operates as the Holy Spirit. Uh, but we're, we're not modalists, uh, and, and we believe that the, these three persons are all operating simultaneously right now. And the biggest argument against modalism that I've ever seen is the, is the uh, baptism of Jesus. We have Jesus physically right there in the, the water, being baptized, we have the Holy Spirit ascending in the manner of a dove, and we have the Father speaking from above, the, this is my beloved son, son, in whom I'm well pleased. So you have three distinct persons existing all there, and yet the one God. So um, modalism, the flaw in that is that it's, uh, they, they do not acknowledge that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all existing simultaneously, distinctly. And they must exist in one form at a time. He just simply transforms from one to the next. Um, so that's my attempt to explain Trinitarianism and the difference between Trinitarian and modalism. So now we've we presented that, and, and we can go look further at, okay, we believe Jesus is eternal, the Father is eternal, the Holy Spirit is eternal, and, and there's one God. And we tried to explain this the best we can, but now we want to go back in time and look at uh, how exactly did Jesus exist? Did he exist within God, uh, within the Father, or within God generically as uh, uh, as a substance that was uh, taken out, and, and like like Eve was taken out of Adam, which is uh, what Brother Joseph has put forth as that's as concisely as I can put it. All right, before we go on, any other statements from each of you before we go on to further in the study here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I suddenly remembered what I was going to say to Sebastian earlier, which was basically uh, the, 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 the Holy Ghost is, is the Theonustus, or the breath of God. And so, you know, he, he's got a valid point in that, you know, when God breathed on Adam, that was definitely the Holy Spirit as a person breathed, breathed in Adam. So it, it's quite logical to assume that, that as he, the Holy Spirit, was breathed on Adam, when Adam was put to sleep and the rib was taken out, the same Holy Ghost that was in Adam was obviously in Eve. So the Holy, you know, so that, that, that that's what I was thinking of there. And that actually, that's from, uh, I got that from uh, Timothy's epistle. I think it's 2 Timothy 3.16. And another point I want to make, now I don't want to be shot down as a heretic, or anything for this point, because it's just meandering thoughts, you know, and that's what we're doing, we're being open amongst brethren, and we are allowed to think for ourselves, and I just thought, you know, when we was talking about, when, when Sebastian said that, that kind of, that, that the father has a seat, the son has a seat, that then I thought, well, if us people are seated in heavenly places already, who indwells us? That's him, the Holy Ghost. So there's the Holy Ghost seat within us, perhaps. Just a, just a meander and fall. That's a really good thought, Bill. As a matter of fact, I hadn't thought of that, and that's awesome. And I will reference, i got to look it up, but the Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of Unity. That He is the one who unifies both the Father and Son and us to the Father and Son. All right, very good. So we're already making some progress, uh, new understandings uh, coming to us. All right, let's move on in my notes now. And uh, I'm going to, these are things that we are going to go into very, very deeply 
to much uh, um, greater extent later. I would just like, uh, you know how sometimes ha someone will uh, have a, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, uh, a 10 second dr drill or something, they ask you something, you got to give a quick response. I'm going to ask each of you to respond to, to, to one of these. Uh, John 1628, uh, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world again. I leave the world and I go to the Father. The key phrase is, I came forth from the Father. Now the question is, does it mean he came from the fellowship, nearness, companionship with the Father? like an angel would, uh, or does it mean he came out of the essential mystery of being God or came out of the substance or essence of God? Go ahead. Uh, my thought is both, Luke. Absolutely both. Okay, Brother Bill? Yeah, I think, I think that, that, that Sebastian's got that right, that both are applicable in that sense and in that context. Okay, all right. Thank you. Then the next next one would be uh, uh, we look at uh, Hebrews thirteen eight. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. So the the question here is, uh, did he always exist as the Son of God? We refer to him now as the Son of God. And this is something that we're going to really took a lot of time in, is really looking at has he ex eternally existed as the Son? And you might be surprised uh, because there are two opposing camps on this that have uh, uh, really strong, um, you know, arguments here. But uh, so if it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and, the, and forever, uh, can you conclude that he always existed as the Son? That's a tricky one, uh, Luke, and here's why. Now, if you look at some of the cults, the people that don't believe Christ is one in essence and substance with God, uh, they'll say, well, he was the first. Now, this is before he was become man. This is in eternity past. He was the first begotten of all creation. So they say, aha. He was the first begotten of all creation. Certainly, that means he was created first. No, no. Uh, he was always within God, but when God says he was the first begotten of all creation, that's just like Eve being the first begotten of all man. She was always pre existent within Adam, but the separation at some point was made so that. God, as God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, created everything at that point, past that point. In other words, he was always with God, always part of God, like Eve was always with Adam, always part of Adam. But before he created anything, the Son was begotten. Okay. Brother Bill? Well... I personally think, this is only what I personally think, is that, you know, when, when it says he is the first begotten of creation, I think that is in conjunction and in line with, with being the first fruit, the first of the resurrection. I is the first to die, yet still be alive and come to life. And, and so he's been the first, and all those who believe upon him been the second, the third, and the fourth, and the others. So he, he, in that sense, I believe he was the firstborn in that creation, you know, i.e. the born again element. Because we need to be born again, born from above. And perhaps this was, you know, reference to the, the, the resurrection power. I, b I believe that also, Bill. I couldn't agree more. However, in context, this was talking about before the sun, moon, stars, angels. It, we're not talking it, it, that in context. I believe it was speaking the first begotten of anything created. Nothing was created that was not created through him. And so it, I think in reference it's talking to uh, Christ begotten as in Eve was 
taken from Adam before any further creation by man could take place, I believe that God begot or, or the substance of God became Christ so that at that point everything else was created. Okay, we're, uh, uh, we're going to, as I said, all of these things we're going to go into in great depth. Uh, for now, these are like uh, bullet point questions here. And there, you, you guys have gone off on the begotten, first begotten part, which we, is, is a different question that we're going to go over later. Uh, I'm really curious how, how we can, you, you take this phrase, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But if you would, just try to try to explain to me what that verse means. He's, un, he's unchanging, which, which is you know, which is the essence of God anyway. You know, he's the unchanging one, and this is what this is a good indication for, for anyone who doesn't believe that Christ was God to show that he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end always exists and always will be. So I think that that's how we can summarize that, you know, that, that he is unchanging in his attributes of being eternally the son. This is, I take the, the time that he was and always will be eternally the son. Okay, Brother Joseph? Well, I, I go back to mankind being the only thing ever created that is an image of God. And I believe that uh, Eve was always within Adam. Eve pre-existed within Adam. As, lo as long as Adam was, Eve was also. And at a point, Eve was taken separately, and even though at his essence, his substance, was separated for further creation and for fellowship the same way Christ was taken the Father, be part of Himself, was hit some attributes were separated, but yet still one in essence and substance, so that further creation could happen, and and uh, that was God's method of of creation, and uh, and so Christ was always within God, part of God, the substance of God, but like Eve, uh, took a subordinate place while being equal became subordinate while being the substance of equal to be, took a seat of subordination in other words Eve had a, a separate and a, and a different uh, uh, thing to do but yet was equal to Adam and I think the son is, is the one who sacrificed himself at the will of the father but of course the Holy Spirit united them in purpose and in essence uh, the third person of the Trinity. So, yeah, I, I think that Christ has always been God and has always existed within God. And at some point, the first part of creation, as the Bible says, was God, the Son. Okay. Um, the reason I've chosen these verses and uh, the next one I'm going to ask you about, uh, these are um, sample verses that people use uh, on opposing sides of the eternal sonship question uh, to um, support their sides. Uh, so I just want to get a quick response here on those, but uh, the, th the final one I'll ask you about right now is this, um, uh, John 17, 5. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. The question is, does this mean Jesus is eternal, or he merely existed before the world existed? Well, I'd say that means he was eternal, because we know that, that, that when he was manifested in the flesh, he did lay aside he, his full glory to, to be manifested in the flesh, because it says that, that, that no, no man, no flesh can see God face to face. So you know, if you didn't lay some of his, you know, glory aside as it was manifest you know no one would be out of sin they're all got disintegrate because God is known as a, a, a consuming fire that's how holy powerful and, and amazing he is so yeah in that sense you know he, he set aside his glory while he came to earth and then obviously when he was received up again you know he, he, he put upon himself his glory again 
Okay, Brother Joseph? Yeah, I absolutely agree with Bill. Uh, he, and, and it does say that he, sub, he subordinates, subordinated himself to the will of the Father as a separate but equal person of God. He, he subordinated himself to the will of the Father to do what had to be done. Okay. Uh, oops. Let me see. I just wanted to know, is that alright if I just interject for one second, Luke? Because I didn't say earlier. What what Brother Sebastian is saying that the Holy Ghost was in Adam and when Eve was created, also in Eve, because it was part of God's plan that the the Holy Spirit was in both and it was already pre planned. I think I'm in agreement with that. So the Holy Spirit was in Adam. But also Eve, now Eve was going to be created out of man. So I think I'm agreeing with that point. All right, very good. Brother Joseph's already gaining some ground in his persuasion of the saints here. Um, I'm. Uh, what I'm. I want to ask one further follow-up on this last question. Uh, this verse, John 17:5. Do you really think that this is a strong proof text for the eternality of Jesus? Because someone could easily say that, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Uh, the Some of these creation verses, or verses like this, uh, we, we take these as uh, evidence that uh, Jesus is eternal, and yet someone like... Uh, a Jehovah's Witness or uh, somebody who believes that Jesus is a creature. He's not eternal. He was created by God. God first created Jesus, his son, and then the Father and Jesus, or some verses say Jesus did it, but he created everything else. He Before the world began, he was created and then he did the rest of creation. Uh, so can you see how there could be a, an argument where they could say, well, that doesn't prove the eternality of Jesus in that, in that verse or not? I personally can't. I'm, I'm looking at the and I'm look, looking at it really closely at that verse, and I really can't see how they can, they can come to that point. It's, to me, personally, it is clear, absolutely clear, that the, the fact that, you know, and I'll read it again, and now, O Father, glorify thou me, all right, with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee. So he had this glory, this eternalness, you know, with God before the world was, before creation. So, yeah, I can't see how they can try and get away with that. They might try, but to me, I think that's pretty profound, and, and that is pretty steadfast. Mm -hmm. Brother Joseph, do they have any wiggle room there, you think, or is it uh, that rock solid, that one verse there? Well, it, it's funny, it's funny, Luke, because I've, I've, since I put this video out, I've, I've uh, you know, deleted a lot of horrible uh, conversations with people. People can take a verse, and they can, they can twist it, and, and if they come with a presupposition or a pre, uh, uh, an opinion in spite of Scripture, you can twist any scripture to say almost anything. Just ask the JWs or the Mormons. And so I can see how they can twist it to make their point. But in context and in light of all scripture as a whole, no, absolutely not. I couldn't agree more than with what Bill said. All right, let me move on into my notes here. Now, I'm going to be reading some things that are uh, extra biblical. And... Um, uh, then, of course, I just want your response to it, but uh, this is just a little bit about church history. The early church, so influenced by the Greek philosophy of Plato, which was filled with a dualism, the thought of spirit as good and matter as evil, had a difficult time thinking of Jesus, the human, as being equal with God the Father. Arius, one of the heretics of the early church, thought Jesus as being one of the earliest created beings. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about, well, I'll, I guess I can finish this. The Nicene Creed 
answered Arius by declaring that Jesus was of the same substance as God the Father, that he was, quote, very God of very God, unquote. Uh, so your response, if you're not aware of this problem, uh, this kind of question, uh, dating back to early church history, uh, the the question of you know identifying who Jesus is is he God Almighty is he eternal is he a, a created being uh, is he an angel as the Gnostics were saying is it does he not have did he have physicality to him because anything physical all matter is evil therefore Jesus didn't really exist in the flesh and that's why the scriptures say if you uh, that Jesus was manifest in the flesh, I think, is her. Uh, how's that? You, have, you can correct me on the terminology, but it, there's this question: Can you? Can, will you declare that Jesus was manifest in the flesh? Is in answer to these Gnostics that were teaching that no, Jesus was not physical. So uh, at the root of all these problems is early church history is this idea that matter is evil. And therefore, Jesus couldn't have been physical matter. He must have just been a spirit being. And then the other thing that Arius introduced is that uh, uh, Jesus was the earliest created being. Uh, he's not eternal. And then the Nicene Creed took a stand against it. Okay, your reaction to that, please. Yeah, well, just briefly to say the Nicene Creed is spot on. So the problem is that the, the Gnostics, the Arians, who were early Gnostics, you know, as you rightly said, assumed that all flesh was evil but we know that the word says that, that that all evil things proceed out of the heart which is the soul it's not the flesh so if the soul is clean and the spirit is clean so also is the flesh so it's not really a flesh man because we're all carbon based beings you know on earth so Jesus God had to be manifest as a carbon based being on earth so the flesh itself isn't evil. That's a stupid Gnostic teaching. It is the soul, the, the, the mind, the thought, the will and the emotions of a person that can be evil and not the flesh. All right, thank you. Brother Joseph, do you, your reaction to this uh, little church history? Well, number one, they're so goofy. I'm surprised they don't have televangelists on TV today. And number two, I, I, I now understand uh, anytime there's trouble, they go, what's the matter? Well, there you go. Matter. As far as that moves, I would probably agree with Sebastian. Yeah, there's there's a lot of Gnostic televangelists out there. Okay. All right. Thank you for a little moment of humor. <laughs> okay, I'm going to move on and uh, uh, now. Uh, my my statement here that we want to address in, in the study is I say that if Jesus is not eternal then he is not God uh, and that's what we're going to be exploring next uh, just your first reaction to just this declaration I've just made here I mean that I agree with what you just said it's fundamental yeah, without that, uh, without eternality, there can be omniscience and uh, of the five attributes of God. He, he must be. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not surprised that we're agreeing on that. Now, let's look at 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Uh, now, you may know that I'm, I'm uh, a King James preferred. In other words, I, I always look at the King James Version, and, and then if, if I get confused, I might look at other translations or concordances or, or commentaries in uh, Greek. But I first look at King James, but I'm not King James only. But in the King James, this is a very distinctive thing because in King James it says God was manifest in the flesh. Whereas if you look at some other modern translations and it says Jesus was manifest in the flesh or he was manifest in the flesh. Now, there is a great distinction when you say God was manifest in the flesh versus 
he was manifest in the flesh or Jesus was manifest in the flesh. It, it is much more clearly stating that this person that was manifest in the flesh is God. Uh, but the, another interesting thing, of course, is, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. So this mystery, <laughs> this like the Trinity is referenced, is a mystery. Now we have this godliness, is a mystery, God, mystery of godliness. Uh, so uh, our attempts to figure it out and explain it, uh, it, it's not a new problem that we wrestle with. And, uh, and who knows, by the end of the study, just as Brother Bill received a new insight from Brother Joseph, uh, who knows by the time we're done what new insights and conclusions we may come up with by the time we're finished. But please respond to this verse, 1 Timothy 3.16. God was manifest in the flesh. Yeah, I'd just like to say briefly that the two points with that verse. Uh, first, it is without controversy. In other words, it's a settled issue. You know, it's pointless arguing and, and causing controversial division over this. It's a fact. It's said that the God was manifest in the flesh. So don't bother even debating anyone out there. It's not a controversy. This is a fact. And second point is, you know, when you made that point where some translations would say Jesus was manifest in the flesh and God was manifest in the flesh. If you look at the original coin Greek, which I do look at, and, and I think the King James is spot on there, that the word is theos. So it is literally God being manifest in the flesh. Not, you know, just a, a person called Jesus who suddenly attained Godship and became God and he was manifested. No, this was literally... Uh, 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 the, the second person within the Trian Godhead was to manifest in the flesh, and that is absolutely clear within the Greek and within the King James. Amen. Uh, I like the emphasis of the fact that this is should not be controversial. We should just all just everybody just should be in agreement. It's a settled fact. God was manifest in the flesh, and we know that the one that was manifest in flesh is Jesus, and therefore, you know, deductive logic tells us that Jesus is God. Brother Joseph? Well, I, I, uh, I think I'm a King James firstist also, uh, Luke, and, uh, and they, they absolutely are the best translation here. If we had Joe's amplified version, it would say, Jesus being God, the second person of the Trinity, that's how I would start it if I had my amplified version going. I just want, I would agree with that because I, I don't know if anyone remember, but I did used to on my uh, sort of videos that you mentioned earlier. I used to have like Bill's amplified version, and I know I've done the same sort of thing as, as as Sebastian done there. Yeah, that's uh, I I re mentioned your sorted videos earlier. And uh, to, to the viewing audience, um, you should go to the Panda Man Evangelist um, YouTube channel, find his videos titled Sorted, and he, that's what he's done. He's, he takes a verse, and then he sorts it out, and basically it is Brother Bill's amplified version because he explains the verse, he expounds on it, he amplifies it, and you know what? If we check the amplified, actual amplified version um, right now, it might actually say exactly what you said, Brother Joseph, uh, because the amplified does amplify and expound on it further. Yeah, yeah, I, lo I love uh, uh, Bill's stuff, yes. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, so, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity is a difficult doctrine to explain. I'm reading from an article. It is one of those doctrines that deals with an infinite God, and there are some things about God that are declared but not easily defined. Eternal is one of the attributes of God that cannot be said of anything or anyone else. Everyone else is created and therefore has a starting point. Only God is eternal. So if Jesus is eternal, then he is God. And I would add, conversely, I would say, if Jesus is not eternal, then he is not God. Your reaction to that? Yeah, spot on. 
Yeah, the phrase, who are you, and he answered, I am that I am, is a terribly, uh, it's hard on the mind, but uh, very adequate in explanation. Yeah, uh, we will go into great detail on the I am verses here uh, pretty soon. Uh, okay, now that was the bone of contention with Arianism, the 4th century heresy which rejected the full deity of the Son of God. The issue was not whether the Son was divine in some sense, but whether he shared the same essence. Homoousia is the Greek word, I guess. The same essence as the Father. In particular, Arius held that sonship necessarily implied having a beginning. While Arius affirmed that Christ was pre-existent, and that all things were created through him, he also believed that the Father created the Son. According to Arius, quote, if the Father begat the Son, he that was begotten has a beginning of existence. Hence, it is clear that there was, when he was, there was, I, it's probably a misprint, hence it is clear that there was a time when he was not. Arius was careful not to use the word time. Oh, <laughs> that's why the word's not in there. Okay, I'm sorry, I inserted the word. So, it's, Arius wrote, uh, hence it is clear that there was when he was not, unquote. Then the article says, Arius was careful not to use the word time because he believed the sun existed before the ages began, but for Arius, eternality and sonship could not go together. The son was a divine being, but a created being with a derivative deity. Well, I, I, I think I came up with my little theory 1900 years too late. I, I should have spoken to Arius about this situation. He might have understood it better. Well, I, uh, I I think you could have been helpful, but I'm not sure the Arius had ears to hear. Uh, some of these old theologians were very arrogant, I think, and uh, they were. I, I, I can match up to that arrogance, brother Luke. Look at what I'm doing today. Okay, brother Bill, what's your reaction to this little history with Arius? Arius. Uh, well, I, I'm just saying, you know, he was. He was an early Gnostic, and, and he was a heretic, you know. And he did, unfortunately, he tried to mix in, you know, what is uh, uh, mystery and spiritual and godly with what was uh, Greek philosophy, you know. And and to try and marry them in doesn't always work. And I think that's where Arius and the Arians went wrong. You know, some things are very spiritual and very deep. And, and they define, you know, Greek logic and understanding. And, and that, that was his, his biggest error. You know, he should have got off his arrogance, you know, his arrogant backside, and he should have just settled down and, 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 and you know, understood the scriptures with, with spiritual understanding. Uh, now, over the years, uh, I've taken on all kinds of uh, subjects that... Uh, uh, I, I call I do consider heresies that have sprung up throughout church history and that we're dealing with today. And I, I made the case that all the problems that we see today in terms of her heresies, like for example, there there are still people today who do not believe in the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Uh, there there are still people today uh, who believe that uh, you know faith is insufficient that. You've got to have works too. Uh, whatever the whatever the uh, problem is today, it can be traced back uh, to the early scriptures. We we find them all listed there. Uh, some people say Paul was a, a false apostle. Well, you can see in the scriptures Paul was defending himself from those people attacking him even then, saying he's a false apostle. So these charges, these heresies, they can all be found in the scriptures and the early uh, church history writings. And uh, so we're not dealing with anything really new, but it might surprise some people that some of these things are ancient heresies. 
So when we when we talk to a Jehovah's Witness, and they they tell you that uh, they they rewrite their Bible, the they have what they call the New World Translation. They did their own translation uh, so that they could support their false doctrines. Now, see, what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to read the scriptures and take out of the scriptures the truth and have our doctrines. But what they decided to do is they formulated their own ideas apart from the Bible, and it didn't match the Bibles. So they had to write their own Bible to conform to their heretical ideas. So they, they wrote their own translation called the New World Translation, and they famously changed a lot of verses, but the, probably the most famous is John 1.1. If we know that that scripture says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we use that verse as one of the strongest uh, proofs of who Jesus is, uh, that he is eternal, uh, and he is God. Uh, but uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they inserted another word in there, a and they have it, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. And the G is a little g, not a capital G, showing that they don't believe that he is uh, Almighty God, God Almighty. He's some kind of lesser God. They actually go on to teach, uh, if you get to know him further, you'll find out that they really believe that Jesus is Michael, uh, who was created. Michael the Archangel. So the Jehovah Witnesses and Arius and other people that we may encounter, they're teaching that Jesus is not eternal God Almighty, that, that he is in fact a creature. Uh, he is, God created him, whether he created him as the angel Michael or we created him as some uh, son of God that's less than the Father, that's some kind of a deity but not truly God Almighty. Uh, this, this, we're seeing here now, that this is not a new heresy. It goes back, and I don't know if it goes back any further than Arius, but Arius is where we're at right now. So respond to that, please. Well, yeah, yeah it's, it's heresy, and yeah, and I've, I've read the, you know, portions of the, of the JW New World Translation, but when it is right, they insert the word, I, God, as in A and then a small g God, and the, the only other example you see in the Bible is where you know the the, the, the Pharisees were, were likened to you know God small g, and, you know, and that was because you know they they had on earth certain powers and jurisdictions to 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 either give someone life or death, you know, in a judicial sense. So really, that the moment. You know, Christ, who's God manifest in the flesh, to a nice human being who was given authority over life and death in a judicial sense, as opposed to what he is, and that is being fully God. You know, the, the, the divinity, that, that they wipe away his divinity. And at times, if you argue with them and you've made the right point, you know, if they're on a good day, they might promote Jesus to, oh, well, Jesus is really the Archangel Michael. So it's better, you know, but nonetheless, that they take away and strip away the divinity of Christ himself, you know, and, and that, to me, you have you have errors, you have heresy, and you have damnable heresy. And to me, you know, sadly enough, you know, that comes under a damnable heresy. That That is a dangerous heresy, and it will send people to hell, because Jesus is God, and he forgives sins. Amen. Uh, so that gets back to the point we're making that uh, um, God is eternal, and if Jesus is not eternal, then he can't be God. If Jesus is eternal, then he is God, because only God is eternal. But uh, Brother Joseph responded to that, and the, uh, the, the little statements I read about uh, Arius and how this all originated. Well, the first thing that catches my attention, uh, Luke, is that whether it's uh, the JWs or, or the Mormons or work salvationists, anyone who, who uh, has a, a axe to grind tends to drop little things like A or insert a word B. You know, they change scripture just by a dot or a tittle, 
and to make a point of theirs that's actually out of context, and they do that all the time. It's really irritating to me. But yeah, uh, uh, clearly, clearly, the rejection of Christ as being God is is the misunderstanding or the mistaken uh, of the nature of God is the basis for all cults, I think, and and mistaken religions. Yeah. So this gets back to my uh, my statement of faith and my declaration at the beginning of our talk today, and that uh, uh, personally, uh, I like to uh, have a broad tent for so that everybody can come in and participate. And if someone disagrees me on with me on Bible translations or you know just the description of of hell or or, or the uh, eschatology, you know, the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, all these things, and a hundred other things. Uh, if they disagree with me on those things, I could have a cordial conversation and we can learn from each other. Hopefully they'll be cordial too. And, and, and it, I think it's beneficial to talk even on those things we don't have to agree. But this is a deal breaker. This is so important that this, I believe this question is the internality of Jesus is a deal breaker. And if someone uh, is not settled on that and doesn't believe that Jesus is eternal, then they don't believe he's God. And, if, and, and we, we're going to go on the study to see further why this is critically important. Um, all right, let me move on to the next statement here. Uh, okay, no matter our experience of sonship, such as having a beginning, the divine must be the lens through which we understand the human, not the other way around. Without the eternality of the Son, we do not have a Christ who can fully save, because we do not have a Christ who shares in all the attributes of deity. Without eternal sonship, we cannot affirm that the Father has always been the Father. And if the Father has not always been in communion with the Son, then love cannot be eternal. For the Father would have to create another being in order to give and receive love. Likewise, it is only with the eternal Sonship that the economic trinity, that which we see about God in the unfolding of the redemptive history, corresponds to any real ultimate truth about God. The God who is must be the God who always was. Uh, there's a lot there. Uh, I want your response to the whole thing, but particularly I'm interested in your, con in your response to this question of love. Well, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and go first. Uh, I really, really believe that... Uh, Bill really hit on something important that I hadn't considered. The 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 Holy Spirit being the spirit of unity within all of us uh, and bringing us into communion with God, but also uniting the natures of God, because clearly uh, God is one in essence and in nature, and I think the unifying uh, principle or the unifying person is actually the personification of love, the Holy Spirit. So. Uh, I really, really, truly believe the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are united through the Spirit, which is love, personified. Amen. Brother Bill? Well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, the, you know, one of the amazing scriptures that hit home to me in regard to the essence of God is, 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 is you know, where, where it says, you know, that, that, that he that loveth not knoweth not God, for he is love. Now, it doesn't describe, you know, it doesn't say he can love or he has an attribute of love or he likes to love. It is speaking of the essence of God himself is love. So it's a definitive. God himself, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, are love in essence. And I think that's very, very important to know. Uh, some of you may know uh, Brain Audi. Uh, she, I don't think she's uh, any longer uh, participating in YouTube, uh, but the first time I ever heard this uh, point about love um, in this way 
uh, was by Brain Audi years ago when I first came on YouTube, and it really blew me away because it really, to me, is a, a certain proof of Trinitarianism. Um, as you said, brother, the, the scripture says that God is love. So, therefore, we know that God is eternal and God is love. Therefore, love must be eternal. And for love to exist, there must be a giver and a receiver of love. Otherwise, there's no love. If you, if you have love to give, but there's no one to give it to, there's no love. And if, it, and if there's someone wanting to be loved, but there's no one to give up them, there's no love. So, this to me is a, a, a real clear uh, proof that there had to be at least two parties existing in eternity. Of course, I believe there's three, but there had to be at least two for love to be eternal. And uh, I'm glad that this, uh, this is something that we're uh, covering now in this because uh, it's, um, um, besides the love question in this section here, you have this idea that uh, uh, we do not have a Christ who can fully save because we do not have a Christ who shares in, the, in all the attributes of God. Uh, the scripture says only God can save, right? And it says there's only one Savior, and it's God. So how do you rec uh, how do you uh, make that work together? As I'm saying, this is why Christ has to be God. There's only one Savior, and there's only one that can forgive sins, and that's God. And as we know that Christ came to earth, you know, he is Saviour, and he is that who forgave sins. So, yeah, to me, that, that's blatantly obviously that Jesus is God. So, all of these attributes, really, they all work together to make us understand who God is, his nature, and eternality, and love are the two attributes that are is essential for this to all make any sense at all, understand salvation. Well, yeah, I just want to say, because Jesus even said, you know, if you've seen him, you've seen the Father. So that just shows you, personifies, as you says, that, 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 that Christ's attributes are the Father's attributes. Okay, Brother Joseph, anything before I move on? Uh, just that it makes me think of the work salvation and how heinous and how elevating they how how prideful and, and vain that that theology is that uh, they believe that they are a part of their salvation it, it really elevates them to a, a prideful state that even Lucifer was reaching to yeah I, I think that the uh, you know people talk about uh, the, what you must do to be saved. Now we know that a person must believe on Jesus to be saved. And, and when Jesus was asked, "What works does God require of us?" He said, "The work of God is this: to believe on the one He sent." Paul was asked, "What must I do to be saved?" And he said, "Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved." So both Jesus and Paul answered a direct question in the same way: believe. Now, neither Jesus nor Paul expounded on it any further and said, believe on the Lord Jesus, go get water baptized, repent of your sins, change your life, on and on and on. All the, the, the list goes on and on of all these people who are adding to the, the one requirement, which is believe on the Lord Jesus. But what, how can a person believe on Jesus? Uh, I, I, do, I do believe that something that naturally occurs before we believe on Jesus. I'm not going to say this is universal. I don't like to apply uh, my experience or certain things that I think are uh, probably happen as a universal law. Everybody had the same experience, but I think what happens when people believe on Jesus, they first understand they, they reach a state of humility. They, they come to the conclusion, whoa, I can't do it. I need help. It's like the, 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 the tax collector and the Pharisee. 
the Pharisee is full of pride and boasting about all the stuff he did. He's not like other men. And, and then the lowly tax collector, he won't even lift up his head to God. He just bows and says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that's the man that's justified. And the difference was pride versus humility. The, the tax collector had reached a state where he was humble. And, and I think before we believe on Jesus, what normally happens, maybe not every case, but uh, normally we reach the, case, the, the state of mind where we say, I realize I need Jesus. I can't be saved. I can't get to heaven on my own. I need him. <clears throat> so uh, I, don't know, I don't know what led me into that, how that is even relevant to what we're talking about, unless one of you guys can connect it. I can connect it easily, Luke. It, 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 it's probably what I, I interjected that was probably off topic, but it just struck me as how the work salvation crew uh, both elevate themselves and demote the work of God in order to attain salvation. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly, you're the, exactly the guy that sent me down that rabbit trail. I'm sorry, Luke, you know I do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he has got, so he has got a valid, he did have a valid point there, yeah. Because by being a higher lordship salvationist or work salvationist, you are demoting Christ's divinity in as much that he is not enough to secure salvation by his finished work. So that you know, yeah, I think it's made a valid point. You know, these lordship salvations are small gods, you know, little G, thinking that they can, you know, add to, to salvation. So yeah, that is access. That's quite a sneaky point, but it's a valid point. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to move on here. Uh, uh, now, uh, I think it was Brother Bill speaking to me earlier today, I sent in my notes that I put together on this. Uh, Brother uh, Joseph, I, I tried to send you my notes on this that I put together the last few weeks, but uh, for some reason I, I couldn't get an email to go to you for some reason. So we can talk about that later. So I, I'd be happy to give you all my notes so that you're not caught off guard by any of this stuff I prepared. But I, pr I probably blocked you, Luke, for having that <laughs> about something. <laughs> that, that may be the case, but maybe we can correct that so I can give you these notes. Uh, but uh, Brother Bill said to me, now I understand, Brother Luke, you're, you're playing the devil's advocate. And, you know, it might be, it might be a, a standard use uh, point, a way of describing this situation. I think uh, in philosophy they call it uh, sophistry. Sophistry is the ability to uh, take the other side of an argument that you don't necessarily agree with, but you defend it anyway just because that's, you're called on to, to take that side. And so what we're going to be going on in the rest of this study is, is talking about this question of the eternal sonship. And as I said, there's two sides and there's two camps. There's, there's two good arguments. And uh, I've been going back and forth as I'm studying this on this. And as I said, I don't necessarily have a, a strong position yet. And, and maybe I will up by the time this is all finished. But what is important, what is essential, is that I uh, understand, and you guys agree, that Jesus is eternal. He's not created. And that this, this is a fact that is essential. And because if he wasn't eternal, he wouldn't be God. And if he wasn't God, he couldn't save us. So it's that important. And yet, we're going to look at both sides of this question, eternal sonship. And uh, neither one of them that, that I can see so far in my study, I have a problem with in terms of what I would call heresy. It's just different ways. It's like <clears throat> a lot of people might not like this either, what I'm going to say is, but I'm, I'm Trinitarian, but I'm not anti-modalist. If, if you were a modalist and you thought that, you know, Jesus is God, and sometimes he operates as the Father, sometimes he operates as the Son, but Jesus is eternal God Almighty. I could accept that. Uh, that's another way of, of seeing this Godhead, seeing this uh, deity of Christ, because at least 
as a modalist, you are saying Jesus is not a creature, he's eternal God Almighty. <clears throat> now, there are some people that would say, oh, you're too liberal, Brother Luke, that uh, you should not accept modalists. Uh, but I, I've come to the same conclusion so far on this point here on eternal sonship. We're going to be looking at both sides of this question. And as Brother Bill says, playing, playing the devil's advocate, or I'm just trying to be fair and present both sides. And so that the audience can see that there are two sides. And then as, as we go on studying this, we look at both sides. And I, I've been really happy over the years when I've been willing to look at both sides of a question. Uh, the very worst thing that's ever happened to me is I learn more. <laughs> and, and sometimes sometimes my, my position even shifts. Sometimes it doesn't shift, but at least I learned more. So that's what I'm hoping to accomplish here. So when we talk about the, uh, uh, the eternal sonship, we're going to just look at both sides. But now we're going to go a little further into this question of eternality of, of Christ. So let me first get your response to what I just said in terms of this. Uh, uh, just my last statement. React to that, please. Well, the first thing I would say, Luke, is you're taking up my, my theories on the Trinity, and you're also saying you're playing devil's advocate. Uh, <laughs> not, not necessarily the best way to put it. But, you know, it, it's funny. <clears throat> the, only, the biggest problem I have with modalists and Jesus-only people, I'm like you, Luke. I can see that understanding, and I don't think it, it uh, necessarily, uh, I don't think it at all uh, affects salvation. Uh, now, misunderstanding the nature of God is a whole different issue, but uh, misunderstanding the workings of the Trinity is very understandable. Yeah, the, but the biggest problem I have with them is, is Jesus-only people or modalists tend to condemn us Trinitarians to hell uh, as being her heretics, but yet most Trinitarians are quite understanding of, of the modalists and the Jesus-only positions. So I don't know why that is, but they become quite hostile towards Trinitarians. Yeah, that's very true. Uh, modalists normally refer to us as polytheists. It is true. It's one-sided. You know, I'm willing to accept them even though I don't agree. I have looked very closely and see that they have an awful lot of good arguments on their side, but there's also some serious fatal flaws in their argument that make me uh, remain Trinitarian. Uh, but the devil's advocate position, you have to blame Brother Bill for that. He's the one that used the term, okay? Uh, I, I don't mind blaming Bill. As long as I don't have to blame me, I'll, I'll, I'll spread it around. Yeah. Okay, Brother Bill? Yeah, yeah, this is a well, this is a very deep and awkward situation for me because I know a few modelists and I have been utterly condemned over many years by them, so it strikes quite deep with me. And obviously in response I have, you know, called them out and called them heretics and blasphemers and all sorts of things. So I'm probably not the first person to try and ask, you know, can there be an accord between modelists and Trinitarians? I'm really, and I'm being honest with you, Brother Luke. You know, my, my stance is, you know, in all truth, in all honesty, you know, I see the triunity as fact and is the, 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 the assured way of who God is. And anything out of that is, if I'm, if I'm being kind, let me say, is uh okay <laughs> okay yeah i i did see your your video on the trinity and your um vicious attack of modalists no <laughs> you are actually you are you are not horrible to them but uh i know you 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 are strong more strongly against them than i am uh even though i'm not on their side uh but my my point is uh whether it's a you know a, looking at Trinitarianism and modalism, being willing to look at both sides, or whether it's willing looking at eternal sonship or non-eternal sonship. By the way, non-eternal sonship uh, d does not mean, uh, as, as we're going to be going through it, it just does not take the position that Jesus is not eternal. It's just that he doesn't have, um, uh, is not was not eternally the son, but he is eternal. Uh, but we'll get into more of that as we go. So, um, all right, anything else, uh, Brother uh, brother Bill, before I move into the next part of this? 
no, no, I think I think we covered that. <laughs> we covered that area quite well. Okay. Um, okay. So this is uh, something I took from a place they call Temple Baptist Church, and they they did study on this. So I took some of their notes, and he says, as with John's Gospel. The Holy Spirit begins the first epistle of John with a statement concerning the eternality of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has many attributes concerning his person. We are not here to study them, but one of them is that he is eternal. Man lives in temporal time, or time that has limits both past and future. Everything in temporal time is measured from a point of reference. Quote, past, present, future, before, after, simultaneous, always, later, next year, forever, at 6 p.m., etc., unquote. Time requires limits, but God has no limits. So I th think the point they're making right there is that we cannot apply time to God. Any, any response to that? Well, yeah, we can't because God is timeless and he's, he's the ageless one. But, you know, in, in Christ, as we, as we mentioned the verse earlier, and I think he said it for our benefit, you know, that, 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 you know he gave it to the apostles and, and the prophets and, and showed them that, that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Isn't him showing that there was a beginning, a middle, and an end, but it was trying him in an attempt to try and, because we're, we're so mortal and our, and our brains cannot comprehend or fathom all these high understands of God. So, you know, I suppose he tried to make things as humanly possible for us to understand as, you know, as possible. You know, that's why he spoke in parables and things like that. You know, things that, 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 that we can't grasp, he tries to make easy for us. But yeah, I, I agree with that statement that he is beyond time, you know, but you know, it is limitless. You know, we're constrained by time, whereas he isn't. So I think it's for our benefit that he said he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. But it's not that he's literally, was it yesterday, or he had a start, and tomorrow he's got to finish. Mm -hmm. All right, Brother Joseph. Well, I, I'd first like to agree with Bill that uh, I, I agree that Bill cannot understand these things. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, what, what, <laughs> what, I, what I'm excited about, what excites me the most is this thing about time. Do you realize, yeah, and, and what Bill said is absolutely true, but what, you, what, what I realized and what's so fun to me is to think that in eternity, God is stepping out of eternity and stepping into his creation. God is... For eternity, <clears throat> we'll be stepping into the creation and into time. It says in the holy city there will be seasons, and that the fruits of of, uh, of life, the tree of life, will give new fruit with different seasons. It, the thr thrones of God will uh, fill the universe with His glory from the the holy city. The Creator is actually going to step into His creation and into time with man for all eternity. I think that's an exciting thing to think about. I just want to add that is absolutely mind blowing. It is fantastic and a wonderment, you know, when it happens, but it is mind blowing that right? the, the, the God out of time has decided to come into time because he loves us. How good is God that he decides to do that? Yeah. Yeah. Jesus said that he came down from heaven, and uh, he's, he's, Scripture says he became a man. He said the reason was so that he could die for our sins. So he had to enter time and enter the flesh, and he, why did he do it? So he could suffer and die for you and me. <laughs> That's how much he loved us. So it is, it is amazing that this God who is one, one and only, that he could love us so much that, that he would enter time, become a man, and die for us so that we can have life everlasting. It is mind-boggling. 
Um, okay, um, a little bit further here. Uh, man lives in temporal time or time that has limits, both past and future. Everything in temporal time is measured from a point of reference. Oh, I just read that, didn't I? I'm sorry. Forgive me. I'm my excuse is old age. Um, okay, God exists outside of time. God's eternality entails that He has always existed and always will exist. That He has no beginning and no end. Therefore, temporal terms have no significant application to God. If God existed in time when He created all, there would be one thing that He did not create. Time. God understands time because He created it. One of the cardinal errors that man makes when uh, thinking of time and eternity together is that the eternal God is placed in temporal time. God does not exist in temporal time, nor is he limited by it. Uh, the interesting part of this whole statement to me is that... Uh, uh, yeah, uh, it, it says if God existed in time when he created it all, there would be one thing that he did not create, and that's time. What say ye? Well, I'd only, I'd only say that, that God is God and he do whatever he pleases, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> Yeah, you just you just passed you just passed my pay grade, Luke. Uh, I, I it's hard to comprehend. All I can think of is, outside of time, there had to have been ages and events that marked happenings rather than hours on a clock hand. You're muted, Luke. Thank you. Uh... I was going to respond to what uh, Brother Bill said. Before. I was holding my thought. Now, when I listen to you, I shouldn't have listened to Brother Joseph. So yeah, that's, that's, what happens. that's what happens when you listen to Brother Joseph. You get yourself yeah. confused. It's very confusing. He really, I always get confused when I listen to him. But when I listen to him, I forgot what I was going trying to apply to you, Brother Bill. So I, could you kind of sum up again what you just said there? Maybe I'll recall. Well, what I actually said, I said, well, God is good and he do whatever he wants, really, in oh, time. Yeah. All right, so here's my, here's my question. You know that God cannot do everything, right? And you've heard the, the example, can God create a stone so large that he cannot lift it? Yeah, I've heard that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so there are certain things called paradoxes, and, and uh, uh, but I think the correct way of, of uh, explaining it would be that God can do anything that can be done. You cannot do two opposite things. They can't. They can. They neutralize each other. And nothing's done. You know. <laughs> so God can do anything that can be done, but He can't create a stone that's too large that He can't lift it. Well, yeah, yeah. And we and we. I was being. I was being a little bit facetious, but you know, because we know that God cannot lie. That's one of the things that God can't do. But yeah, in broad, in a, in a broad sense of you know, talking about time and unfavorable things, you know, he can kind of do what he pleases, you know. Uh, okay, listen, uh, we have someone else just joining us, but we're, uh, I'd like for peripheral, uh, whoever, I only see peripheral, I don't see the rest of it there. Prophet, prophet. Who is it? Peripheral prophet, I believe. Peripheral prophet, okay. I'd like for you to, if you could hold on, uh, because we run these uh, broadcasts for two hours and we have nine minutes left so I, I, we're going to close the show with an uh, invitation for salvation uh, but uh, peripheral prophet uh, I do thank you for joining us and if you can hang on after I close the live broadcast uh, we're going to visit privately uh, as long as everybody wants to and uh, so uh, I don't want you to feel like I'm just you're, you're ignored I'd like to know who you are Amen brother no problem not, not a problem with that at all Okay, so uh, I'll make a note in my notes where we left off. Uh, and now, and when I see how much progress we've made, 
uh, we've only skimmed the surface. So it looks to me like we probably have a total of six sessions at this rate. Six sessions, that'll probably be 12 hours instead of two. So uh, it's going to take a while to get through this whole topic. I have a lot of uh, material, a lot of questions to ask you guys. And uh, as I said, I'm hoping that by the time this is done, maybe I can feel real confident in, in uh, you know, making some conclusions on some of these things. But for now, I'd like to do the most important thing that we ever do, and that is that uh, uh, all of the study of the scriptures and all the Bible conversations and all of that means nothing unless a person understands how they can have eternal life in the kingdom of God. I mean, if someone's watching right now and they learn of all this stuff, and uh, it's fascinating, oh, you're talking about time, and this is mind-boggling, and so philosophical, and, and yet they don't know how to receive eternal life. I feel like we failed. So we always want to end every broadcast, I'm taking a few minutes in the end, to tell the viewers, uh, do you think you're going to go to heaven when you die? If so, why? On, on what grounds do you think you're going to go to heaven? On what basis are you going to go to heaven? And uh, uh, we want a person to understand how you get to heaven, what you must do, what's required of you. And I'd ask Brother Bill to, to uh, tell the viewing audience uh, exactly what that is. If someone's watching now and they say, hey, I'm interested, I'm, I'm, I really actually want to go to heaven, what do I have to do? Well, the very basics, it comes down to, as you mentioned earlier, Brother Luke, that, that to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you want to know exactly why you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is, and how salvation is wrought, you know, I can quickly expound it. But basically is that, that, that we know that only God can forgive sins, so we have to conclude logically that Jesus is the one who said he forgave sins, is God manifest in the flesh. We also need to realise that they're all sinners, and we've all fallen short of God's glory, God's perfect standard. God is up here, we're there, all right? But the beauty is that Jesus Christ came from here down to here, to our level, all right? So what we couldn't do because of our, our sin, which is to miss the mark, Christ done for us. He met our mark, all right? Which is the wonderful news, to be honest, because without that, we also know in the scriptures that the wages of this sin is death, which is eternal separation from a loving God. But as, you know, God loves us so much, he did decide to come, you know, from his glory to earth to meet us where we are. And he also, what I like to call, what took place was the great exchange. That Christ exchanged our sin for his perfection. And that is the great exchange. Now, if we used to believe that we are sinners, we have fallen short, and that this Jesus Christ did make that great exchange for us, all right? If we used to believe those <laughs> facts and knowing that he loved us so much and the, and, and the, and the scriptures clearly say that he, that he did die for this exchange sake for us, and this was according to the scriptures, and that he was buried for our sakes. But he also, and this is the fantastic news, that he rose from the dead the third day. And in so he defeated sin, death, hell, and the enmity brought us between man and God. And he'd done that for us. If we believed on these facts this day, and in whom they were brought, which is Jesus Christ, we will be saved and eternally secure. It's not a complicated gospel message. You know, it's just basically believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he loves us. Believe that he was God manifest in the flesh. And he can't work to take away our sins. And in exchange, he gave us all his perfect righteousness, all his goodness and all that, 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 that we need to receive everlasting life. If we believe on this Jesus Christ, we will receive the free gift of eternal life. But we must realize that, that, that Jesus Christ, and this is fundamental, who he is. And although the scriptures say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, now shall be saved, we do need to know who he is. And this is the whole point of this debate, that, that, that Jesus Christ, the one you need to believe in, to, to, to be eternally saved is God himself who was manifested in the flesh. 
If you believe on these facts today and in him, you will be saved and you will pass from death unto life and you will be you will be one of us. You will be a, a brother and sister in Christ and you will, as a promise by God, receive eternal life and be in paradise. So I would encourage, urge, you know, that, that, that you would make that you know this leap of faith. You know, faith just means, you know, that you, you that you, you reason and you can understand, you agree with what, what we're saying. You know, it, 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 you put your trust and your confidence in what we're being teaching, and especially your trust and confidence in who we are teaching about, and that is Jesus Christ. So I would pray that you would do this today and become my brother or sister. Amen and God bless to whoever's listening. Amen. Uh, brother, I have a follow-up question for you that maybe some of the viewers, they understand what you said, and they're happy to hear this. This is what we call the good news, that Jesus will give you eternal life. Uh, if you put your faith in him, he gives you eternal life. And some of these people, though, they may be thinking, that you're asking them to join a religion or, or become a, a religious person or follow some set of religious rules. How does that factor into this? No, it's actually furthest from it. You know, if, 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 you, if you speak to other brothers and sisters, you know, true brothers and sisters in Christ, you know, you, we would all together in unity declare that, that Christ actually despised religion. You know, not religion in its pure sense, which is to feed the widow, look after the poor, and, and take care of people, but religion in the sense that, 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 that they want to bind us back to certain rules and regulations and, and, and make life terrible and impossible. You know, that is not what Christ came for. He came to give us life, eternal life, but also this temporal life to make it more abundant. We're not talking about wealth, abundance and wealth, but we're talking about abundance in, in love and in unity between ourselves, the brethren, and God himself. So, yet yeah, religion is a bad idea. We're not preaching, you know, religion. We're preaching relationship with a living God, which is found through Jesus Christ alone. So, as I'm listening to you, it, it, it sounds like it's really very simple and easy. Uh, the, the simple fact is that uh, uh, Jesus will give us eternal life when we put our confidence completely in Him. When we believe in Him for salvation, He gives us a salvation. Uh, that uh, It's that simple, and it's that easy. Uh, yeah, it, it's literally, yeah, that simple and that easy. You know, we can't, we, God, God isn't unmerciful and cruel and, and you know, <laughs> wanting us to, to receive all knowledge and facts before we can be saved. You know, God gives us the basic instructions before leaving earth, i.e. the Bible. He just says, you know, believe. Throughout scriptures, it's always believe, believe, believe. And so often religion would teach us it's behave, behave, behave. You know, we're never told to, to, to behave the gospel, i.e. the good news. We're, we're, we're just told to believe the gospel, the good news, and that gospel is encapsulated in Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Just believe on him, he will reveal the facts to you, and come join us and become sons and daughters of the living God. Yeah, that's a beautiful uh, play on words. Most people think to go to heaven, they, they go to heaven if they behave. And you're telling them, no, you, you only go to heaven because you believe in Jesus. All right, that's beautiful, and that's why it's called the gospel. That's a Greek word that means good news, and I hope you can appreciate how good this news is. So please put your faith in Jesus, and if you do, make a comment on this video so we know about it. We'd love to celebrate. I want to thank the panelists for participating. We'll be here same time next Sunday. And panelists, if you are available, and after I close the live broadcast, we can talk privately. Bless you all. In the name of our great Savior God, his name is Jesus Christ.